Early Christians never had personal Bibles until the 1400s with Gutenberg's printing press invention. Israelites never had the Tanakh or Talmud of their own. They relied on rabbinical discipleship, the local synagogues and priestly services where scripture was read aloud. And in our day in 2024, we have personal AI assistance in ChatGPT, Logos Bible software, Audible, Amazon Kindle, free online Bible commentaries like EnduringWord.com, and that's not even scratching the surface. You're watching Spirit and Life with Joey Meyer. Jesus said in John 6, 63, that his words are spirit and life. And this channel is dedicated to stirring up a passion for walking in the fullness of his spirit and sustaining an abundant life through his word. What's good, everybody? Joey here, musician, lover of Jesus, and master of making dinosaur-shaped PB&Js. You're watching episode one of Spirit and Life podcast. Today, I want to talk about something I believe is critical to the health of the church today and essential to our happiness and our spiritual and emotional vitality as followers of Jesus. It's not anything new, but takes on a new form in 2024 and beyond. So what is it? It's establishing a modern Psalm 119 heart and culture in the church community and in our homes. So what in the world is that? I'm going to bring in a guest who I believe best embodies this Psalm 119 culture. And then I'll get into the scriptures and then get some practical habits we can incorporate into our lives. The guest's name is George Mueller, an evangelist and orphanage director who lived in the 1800s that cared for and fed up to a thousand plus orphans and started over a hundred schools. Unfortunately, one of my kids stuffed a dinosaur chicken nugget in the flux capacitor of my time machine, so I will just have to share about George Mueller myself. I'm not going to get into his full biography, but I do want to share an important revelation he brought to the body of Christ that I believe needs to be recovered today and represents what I'm calling the Psalm 119 culture, which I'll get into. Let's look at what he wrote. He said, I saw more clearly than ever that the first and great primary business to which I ought to attend every day is to have my soul happy in the Lord. What's interesting is that his answer for the central driving factor of being happy in the Lord isn't to attend more church services, read more books, get on a healthier diet with exercise, or even find a way to make our Christian dream or uh, the Christian version of our dream come true. Not that pursuing dreams or a healthier lifestyle is negative at all. But let's read more of what his daily routine was that helped him keep his soul happy in God. About how for 10 years his habit was to have morning prayer, which would be about praying for whatever came to his mind. This was the most important thing to him. But one day a revelation came and he felt the Lord lead him into a important new habit. That habit was using scripture as a launching point for his prayer. Prayer birthed from one verse after another. He called it experimental communion with the Lord. There would be verses that would bring him to repentance before the Lord, another verse that he would turn into prayer for others, and another verse that would lead him into asking the work of that verse to be wrought in his heart. This is what George Mueller says is the foundation upon which we become happy in God. Scripture-centric, intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit, finding stillness and stability and rest in the holy pursuit of praying the scriptures. With that said, this mindset is exactly what Psalm 119 talks about, and it is desperately needed in our lives. This is foolish talk to the world, to be calling into finding rest, peace, and happiness in a scripture-saturated prayer life. It's language that doesn't even register. The fact is, it's not even about a book. It's not about the exact phrasing in English of our Bibles or the various versions. It's about scripture being a springboard in which our hearts find security and confidence in approaching a God who adores us and longs for deep friendship. It's language that is all about relating to him. Yes, there's absolutely a place for using our own language in prayer, but there's something totally different when it comes to praying the word. Let's now jump into some of the intense language of Psalm 119 so you can see what I'm talking about. It's actually the longest chapter in the Bible and its central theme is finding happiness in a life that hungers for experiencing God in scripture. Many scholars actually believe it was written in a format easy enough to be memorized, which means that the intention isn't just a nice read, but that it would be integrated in our language and in our culture. 
So starting with Psalm 1920, it says, My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. And the HCSB, it uses continually overcome versus the word longing. And the NLT, it uses always overwhelmed with desire rather than longing. In the CEB version, it uses the language worn out by longing. This is some outlandish language. All right, moving to verse 35, it says, Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find the light. In the NLT, it uses, for that is where my happiness is found, instead of there I find a light. In verse 72, it says, The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. This just stirs so many emotions, this kind of language, like feelings of bewilderment over how someone can feel this way and also fuels hunger in me. I want to feel this way. And at times I have felt this way. I want to cultivate this type of intensity in my heart. In verse 103, it says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. There's an interesting Jewish festival called Shavuot, all about giving the, the Torah at, the Mount, at Mount Sinai with some traditions involving eating honey to symbolize the sweetness of Torah study. There's also a custom that dates back to at least the 11th century where kids about to begin their formal Jewish education read and then licked honey off of Hebrew letters, teaching them from the youngest age that Torah is sweet. And this is also known in Yiddish as our Furnish. So let's continue on. Psalm 119, 131 says, I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. So I'll stop there. Let's be honest. What do we talk about with this kind of intensity? Like words saying, panting for scripture. Words like, my happiness is found in scripture, or being consumed with longing. Is this fake? Is it exaggerated? Is it madness? This actually reminded me of the Apostle Paul, who was accused of being mad and beside himself in Acts 26, 24. Festus in that, in that verse said, Paul, are you beside yourself? Much learning is driving you mad. Okay, but Joey, are you really just saying, read your Bible? No, there's so much baggage that comes with that. So many unhealthy, unbalanced, and stale approaches to what we have called quiet times that have seeped into the church and even in my life. So yeah, I'm not just saying read the Bible and neither is George Mueller. He's saying, pray the Bible verse by verse where it makes sense and let its language propel you into your own conversation and intimacy with the Father. Praying the scriptures in this way is vastly overlooked. Praying our own prayers and scripture has been seen as two different activities. And there's absolutely a place for keeping those um, its own thing. But there is a gap in making this kind of hybrid approach to seeking God by bringing the two together. If you remember, the disciples felt a burning in themselves on the road to Emmaus as Jesus revealed the scriptures to them. The scriptures were combined with a relational connection with Jesus. The Holy Spirit is available to us to be this, to be what Jesus was on the road to Emmaus. I, in my own walk, stopped treating Bible reading as primarily intellectual, where I would come with the expectation that I need a profound nugget of truth that I can add to my knowledge bank in order to have a good quiet time. I stopped seeing scripture solely as supernatural that was supposed to grab my spirit and move me the moment I read the first sentence. Now I see it as primarily relational. The wild thing is the access to resources that we have to unlock treasures buried deep within scripture is unprecedented in our day. Early Christians never had personal Bibles until the 1400s with Gutenberg's printing press invention. Israelites never had the Tanakh or Talmud of their own. They relied on rabbinical discipleship, the local synagogues, and priestly services where scripture was read aloud. And in our day, in 2024, we have personal AI assistance in ChatGPT, Logos Bible software, Audible, Amazon Kindle, free online Bible commentaries like EnduringWord.com, and that's not even scratching the surface. 
But the thing is, ChatGPT and other LLM AI models will never replace revelation. It's only going to ever be information. So much missed opportunity to experience a supernatural grace and empowerment to become what George Mueller calls mighty in the scriptures. That's what we want. Does that mean we burn for God and burn for his word 24 seven? The obvious answer is no. Like with many things that's cultivated, our life praying scripture is what I like to see as a garden that requires time and commitment. Our culture has made it difficult to read a book with no pictures, no sounds, no special effects, no emotional soundtrack, no ridiculous comedy, and no modern 21st century language. In the Bible, we have just thin pages, small print, and endless run-on sentences. Boredom and staleness and mundaneness is part of that life, and it's and part of our lives is no different when reading and praying the word. Feeling bored and uninspired is absolutely okay. You're not broken. You're not looked down upon by the Father. Staleness is not a sign of being in sin or being something wrong with us or God giving us the silent treatment, but it's part of the path towards encountering God through his word. This is a bit of an exaggeration of an example, but when my kids run out of screen time, within nanoseconds, they tell my wife and I they're bored. Entertainment today has trained us to expect that our attention would be captured immediately. Boredom can be good. We tell our kids this all the time. It leads my kids into discovering their creativity and forces them into thinking differently. And that's part of the process in seeking and pursuing God in his word. Anyway, I wanna end this episode by playing a clip that I believe is a modern example of George Mueller's heart and the heart of the writer of Psalm 119. Go ahead and listen. And resting upon us. Guys, there is nothing greater than when God reveals God to the human spirit. I've seen every movie. I've binge watched almost every series. I've done every drug. And there is nothing. I've been to every conference. I've spoken on stages of 70,000. I have been in stadiums. I have been in conferences. There is nothing that connects or compares to when one of those words jumps off that page and the Holy Spirit touches my spirit with it and I get a new facet of Jesus that I've never seen before. Nothing touches that. No amount of money touches that. When one word of scripture gets infused with life and meets us in our place of confusion and brokenness and grips our heart, that is worth the thousands of hours of prayer and spending time in scripture. It's worth coming to him even in dullness and continuing to come to him, praying his word and seeking him because he does meet us in this burning like state where the disciples met Jesus on the road to Emmaus where he reveals the scriptures to him. So what is this Psalm 119 heart? It's a lifestyle of praying the scriptures alone or together and letting its intense language become a reality in the way we speak and act. That the body of Christ would be, like in verse 20, uh, consumed with longing for his word. And in verse 35, it would be a place where happiness is found. All right, so now I'd like to pray 2 Kings 22, 8 through 11. And I believe it's also prophetically a picture of what God desires to do in the church today. It was a time when the word of God was woefully neglected. It was a moment when there was a rediscovering of the scriptures. It was a moment where God's leaders literally broke down into weeping because of its neglect. And in verse 18, it actually says about the priest and his secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And they began reading it in the presence of Josiah, the king of Israel at that time. And in verse 12, it says, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. So let's pray this together. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord bless you with a fresh discovery of his word, like King Josiah did, where he tore his clothes in despair after hearing the book of the law that hadn't been heard or read in years. Together, we ask in the fear of the Lord for your kindness and severity to do a deep work in us through drinking deeply of your word. Like Josiah, we need help being tender and soft before you, before your word. Free us of all of the past disappointments of this lifestyle and any false expectations that the church and its leaders have put on us that made us feel less than beloved, less than a son or daughter before you. If we didn't read it every day, the Lord bless you to have an I have found experience of 2 Kings 22. 
loose us from familiarity and stale intellectualization and launch us into encountering you and using the words of scripture to overtake our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've made it this far in the video, please let me know in the comments. I wanna celebrate your endurance and staying with me. Please subscribe if you are interested in more of this type of content. Every subscription is the equivalent of one dinosaur chicken nugget that I could feed to my kids. I'm kidding. I've got some more videos lined up and content planned that I'm excited to share, and I hope you'll join me next time.